Hi, welcome to the Libertarian Alternative. My name is Mark Selzer, and the Libertarian Alternative is an educational television show brought to you by the Libertarian Party as a courtesy to your community. We're here at the Atlanta Marriott Marquis Hotel at the Libertarian Party's Presidential Nominating Convention with Mary Ruart. Now, Mary, you're a research scientist? That's right, by training, that's exactly what I am. And what do you, what does a research scientist do? Well, basically we try to invent cures for diseases, uh -huh. and uh, we usually do it in a form that we can put in a pill so that people can just go to their drugstore, take it, and hopefully feel better. Uh-huh. So, uh, that's what you do for a living, but you also have this other interest in libertarian ideas? Yes, that's correct. And so what do you, what do you, what is the main thrust of that? You write books? That's right. I, I'm primarily a writer, although I do go out and speak about them. And, and healing our world in an age of aggression is basically my, my latest book. It's actually a revision of a book that came out 10 years ago. It's been so popular, mm -hmm. I decided to update it. <laughs> and basically, it's uh, as you can see, it's got the... 9-11. Uh, 9-11 scene, but we have it overshadowed by the dove of peace. Uh -huh. And the point there is that there is a way out. There's a uh -huh. better way. There's a way to heal. There's a way to heal, exactly. So, what is the what is the basic thrust of the book? What is the philosophy that you're trying to uh, put forth in this book? Well, you know, Mark, what we do is we treat each other on a one-to-one -one basis uh, very well. We don't steal from each other. We don't. If we were neighbors, I wouldn't come over and take your things out of your house. We know how to make uh, make peace as uh -huh. neighbors. And if I were to do any of those things, well, if I came over and I beat you up or I started stealing from me, you'd try to retaliate and steal from me. We'd have a Hatfield and McCoy situation. <laughs> we'd be feuding eternally. And so we know, one-to-one, -one, how to behave. But let's say that I go to your house and I say, well, would you contribute to my favorite charity? Of course, as a good neighbor, I honor your choice. But mm -hmm. today, that's not what we do. We go to the government and say, gee, I don't like Mark's choice. He won't contribute to my favorite charity, so I'm going to make sure that a tax is imposed on him so it forces him to do it. So when we interact with each other group to group, we forget. Mm -hmm. We forget our good manners and our good neighbor policy. And most of the time when you do it that way, if I was to voluntarily contribute to a charity, some of that money would actually go for what I was told it was going to go for. But if the government... <laughs> The government takes that <laughs> money from me. The chances it's going to get to the poor person or to the environmental cause aren't very good. That's right. In fact, environmentally, uh, the governments of all countries are the world's greatest polluters. And uh, most people don't know that, actually, but the U.S. military, for example, puts out oh, something like as much chemical waste each year as two to three top chemical companies. And then, of course, when it comes to charity, I, I know I rented to welfare tenants a lot, and about two-thirds of the welfare dollar actually goes to pay the social workers. Uh -huh. So that's not a good deal either. And the way the welfare is distributed is actually counterproductive. It encourages, encourages young teenage women not to get that first job, not to even get their high school diploma, but start having babies at an early age. When they finally wake up and say, whoa, this isn't going to get me anywhere. <laughs> now they have three children to put in daycare. They have to start at minimum wage. They just can't do it. So they're caught. They're caught for a long time. I had, I had teenage mothers come to me and say, well, I'm pregnant now. I'm going to have my baby in a few months, so I'll be able to give you a welfare check for my apartment. It was like a rite of passage. And it's very, very sad. Sad. So we're, we're paying people to behave this way, and they do behave that way. Some of them do. Some of them. I mean, I'm, there were a few that are the kind of people that you and I would want to help, you know, that were struggling out of the trap. But it's so hard. There's so much disincentive because as soon as you get off welfare, you lose your medical benefits and everything. It's a tough, it's a tough thing. It's easy to get sucked in. Yeah, it sounds like a trap. You know, mm -hmm. I guess a lot of people don't think about the fact when you want to help someone with a problem. I mean, we all can't sit around and just let someone who does have a baby, who doesn't have money, who doesn't have any way to help themselves, uh, just be in the street and not have anywhere to live and not have food. But what do you do when the situation of providing for that unfortunate person causes more people to purposely put themselves 
into that unfortunate situation so they can be taken care of as well. Well, and it's not just that. You know, you were talking about people on the street. Mm -hmm. When the situation gets so bad that they're out on the street and literally homeless, then the welfare people aren't there at all for them uh -huh. because you have to have an address in order to get your welfare check. <laughs> you see, it has to be sent somewhere. They won't give you a handout. So what you see is the people who are truly desperate, the homeless, mm -hmm. they don't get help from the welfare agencies. They have to rely on private charity. And that would be okay, except that our regulations often prevent private charities from helping them. The one story I remember very well, because as a landlord I had to meet all these city codes, was that Mother Teresa's helpers, the missionaries of charity, the, the order she founded, actually were in New York trying to help the homeless. They bought abandoned buildings to try to fix them up. And they bought a, a pair of buildings and showed their building plans to the city inspectors, they approved them. But when the nuns started the renovation, they said, no, no, you have to have a new elevator in there too. It's an extra $100,000. The nuns didn't have that much money. They didn't want to spend money on an elevator. They had to abandon the project. Wow. The homeless in New York City were literally left out in the cold. So there's, uh, the reason that people are homeless is because of government regulation, not the fact that government is doing too little but the fact that government is doing too much. That's true. You know, um, there was a study done on what causes homelessness. And what was found is that the cities that have the highest zoning regulations, city inspectors, and um, other types of restrictions mm -hmm. are the ones with the highest percentage of homelessness. And the reason is that the, um, the price of the houses go up. So, of course, rents go up. Uh -huh. People can't afford them. They end up in the streets. Yes, it's all supply and demand. If you make, I remember in the area where I lived in Hollywood, there were there was a time when many new apartment buildings opened up. They just built somehow they managed to get past the zoning laws and build a bunch of new apartment buildings in that neighborhood, mm -hmm. and the rent went just way, way, way down. There were all of these signs out in front of the buildings mm -hmm. that said "Move in, please." You know, first first month rent free, no security deposit. Mm -hmm. And they were desperate to get people to move in there. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why rents are high, because they won't let them build. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the taxes and regulations on building often double the price of building at all. That's right. That's and exactly then right. a lot of times you just can't even uh, change the zoning laws. I mean, they make zoning laws that actually prevent building and they make laws that keep you from vacating old dilapidated buildings and putting up new buildings that would be cheaper and easier to maintain than the older buildings that are falling apart because you can never get somebody out of those, mm -hmm. those apartments. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very, very difficult to do. So again, homelessness, high rent is caused by government intervention. Mm -hmm. And also then they always try to have a program to fix the problem that they cause mm -hmm. rent control mm -hmm. now what about rent control is yes it? that contributes also to the problem because what happens is as a landlady I can tell you this if you are forced to keep your rents low of course you have a lot of applications so who are you going to pick someone who's just barely going to be able to make it or someone who's got a really terrific job well of course you're going to take the best tenants you can because then you're sure you'll get your rent what mm -hmm. that means is that people who are you know, really on the edge, you know, they're poor, they're just barely making it, they can't get the low rent apartments. They all go to basically the middle and upper classes. That's very true. Uh, we find uh, surveys or studies done on rent controlled apartments and we find that those rent controlled apartments have gone to rich people. And that's why. <laughs> you know, who, who would the landlord rather have in their place? They want a rich person because then if they don't pay their rent or they destroy the place, they can go after them and collect. So what inspires you to uh, be involved in the libertarian movement? Well, I be involved in the libertarian movement. Well, I think it's tragic what's being done to people, especially the people at the edge. Mm -hmm. You know, they they need real help and the government is not only not giving them that help they're destroying them for example when I was renting to a couple of my tenants I got a call from a city official who told me they wanted me to evict two of my tenants really? the reason was yes and the reason was is 
One was doing daycare out of her apartment and the other was sewing curtains for businesses. They had jobs. Yes, they had created their own jobs and they were, you know, still, they were in the startup phase, they were barely getting by. And I told the city officials this and I said, well, we don't care, you know, that's not the point. The point is your apartments are zoned residential, not commercial. Mm -hmm. And in addition, even if we granted a variance so the woman could do this, uh, they'd ha you'd have to really spend a lot of money renovating your apartment because the daycare center needs to be a certain size and things of this nature. And the women haven't paid for a business license. Mm -hmm. Well, I told them I wasn't going to evict them. <laughs> you know, that, that would be cruel. Uh huh. But the city uh, inspectors and the officials kept pestering these women and finally they came to me, both of them, and said, you know, we just can't take the pressure anymore. We've been, we've been threatened with fines and imprisonment. We're just going to quit our businesses and go on welfare because then they won't bother us anymore. And they did, and neither of them ever did get off welfare. So you think much of uh, poverty is created by I think, government? I think most modern poverty is created. I think it's even true for the third world. Mm -hmm. That's why the third world is poor. And, and John Stossel had a wonderful um, expose on this. What he did is he tried to open a frisbee business uh -huh. in Hong Kong, New York City, and India. In Hong Kong, it just took him a couple hours to get a permit. <laughs> in New York, it took weeks. But in India, it was going to take years and he might never get permission. Wow. So how can the Indian people work themselves out of poverty when they can't even get permission to go to work? That could be the best workforce in the whole world there. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a huge workforce. Mm -hmm. And that workforce working in an economy can create more jobs and a huge need for more products and services from this country. Oh, yes. But yet we have people complaining about this calling it outsourcing and saying that it's a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have a defense of this uh, practice known as outsourcing? <laughs> well, I guess I don't think of it quite that way, Mark. The way I think of it is this. The regulations in our country today really have destroyed jobs. Uh -huh. And in the U.S., you can actually calculate what that number is. Every regulator destroys 150 jobs. Uh -huh. So what happens is we destroy all the jobs in the U.S., and then we make our people very, very nervous about seeing jobs, you know, hiring people overseas. But all we really need to do is deregulate our economy. We could rehire the regulators, 150 jobs per regulator. <laughs> well, at least 149 jobs left, right? Uh -huh. So that would hire many of the poor, many of the unemployed. And there wouldn't be a worry then about outsourcing. But wouldn't that just, wouldn't then people just be competing for like Ronald Reagan? And this was, and you constantly hear Republicans saying about how they want to cut taxes and how Ronald Reagan cut taxes. But he was asked, this was actually the biggest tax increase in the history of the country. This is where they tax what you pay your employees. So if you have a, if you have a company and you're hiring people, everything you pay them, you have to pay a certain amount of that, a tax, to the government on just what you pay somebody. So they basically fine you for hiring someone and the, the more people you hire and the more you pay them, the more it, they fine you for doing so. And, and so then we wonder why there's no jobs. Right, because of course what you do is you convert to machinery. Uh -huh. It becomes cheaper than to convert to machinery, so that's what you do. So what about healthcare? Oh, healthcare, oh, I'd like to talk about that <laughs> having been in the industry. It's very, very interesting. Most people don't realize that it costs about a billion dollars for a pharmaceutical firm to put a drug on the market. That's because it has to jump through all these hoops that the FDA requires. And of course, the belief is that it makes the drug safer. Well, it makes the drugs a little bit safer, but it takes a lot longer to develop them. So for example, if a drug is gonna save 10,000 lives a year, and you have to wait 10 years, which is about the average, to get mm -hmm. it, um, it's actually closer to 14, but I'm thinking of, of a set of regulations that was particularly bad. It increased the development time 10 years. So if you would have saved 10,000 lives a year, that means over 10 years you've lost 100,000 lives. And if you've increased safety by only about 100 lives, you have a net mm -hmm. loss. And that's kind of how it works. Not only that, because the drug development time is so increased, the cost is increased too. I calculate that overnight, drug prices, pharmaceutical drug prices, would drop about 80% without mm -hmm. these regulations overnight. So 
that's what we really need to do is get the price down. We can try cost shifting all we want, but it's not going to really change anything. So this is kind of a protection racket then for the big pharmaceutical companies because they're the only ones who can ever get a drug, a new drug, past the FDA. In a sense, that's true. It's created a cartel. And what's happening now, because the costs are so high and only three out of ten drugs even recover their research and development costs, the drug companies are starting to merge at an, at an unprecedented rate. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon there's only going to be a few of them. And the problem with that is they get so big that they're pretty inefficient too. Mm -hmm. And that, that means they simply are a cushion of money for all the failures that precede the big winner. Right. And, and not necessarily so efficient at finding the new cures. Well, they basically become extensions of the government because they're corporate welfare entities protected by the regulation of the FDA. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say they're welfare at this point, but they are protected and it is, it is becoming a cartel. I think that's probably the right word. What's the solution? Well, the solution is to deregulate. If you didn't require studies that kill people, uh -huh. then what you would have is you would have development of drugs that was less expensive. You'd have more drugs you'd have more people saved, but the cost would be much less. So you could replace the FDA with a, 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 a bunch or a group of private competing FDAs. Or certification or firms. Or certification firms that would then, and their reputation would depend mm -hmm. on making sure something that they say is safe is really safe. Right, in fact, that's what they used to do before the FDA. They would have in their advertisements, um, our product has never you know, killed anybody by sudden death, which was a problem with biological preparations back in those days. Mm -hmm. They advertised the safety impact of their, of their products, and that actually worked quite well. There were occasions when people didn't think ahead and had a problem, and that, so the regulations save a few lives, like I said, might maybe save a hundred, but cost 10,000, mm -hmm. or 100,000 even. So there's that kind of a ratio, risk-benefit ratio, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, so what would you say to a person out there that was thinking of getting involved in the Libertarian Party, or, or get them to look at the Libertarian Party as an option? Well, I'd say that simply think about how you relate to your neighbor on a one-to-one -one basis, then look at how we relate to each other, group to group, and you'll see a big discontinuity. Mm -hmm. Now, once you see that, you can apply it to really anything. And of course, when you see that you're being nastier to your neighbor by taxing them and regulating them, it's no surprise to you that it results in bad things like loss of jobs, loss of life, mm -hmm. poverty. So I'd say investigate and see for yourself. So just look into it, look at, look at the facts. Mm -hmm. But you know, how can a person tell which are the right facts? There's so, you get, we hear your opinion, mm -hmm. very little. Mm -hmm. And out there in the world, there, there's so many opinions. How can the person tell that you're right and all the other people out there that are much better funded than the Libertarian Party <laughs> are wrong? How can they tell? Well, I believe that people have common sense. And when they look, they can see. And the first thing that we talked about earlier in this session was how if we relate to each other honestly mm -hmm. and gently, you know, I don't beat you up, I don't steal from you, I don't defraud you or cheat you in any way, we have a good relationship, mm -hmm. or at least a tolerable relationship. But if I'm going to be beating on you and stealing from you, we said we'd have a feud. Uh -huh. Well, it makes sense. But if that happens on a one-to-one -one basis, it's going to happen on a group-to-group -group basis. And that's the kind of common sense I mean. It doesn't take an Einstein to see that the same means get the same ends. Well, thank you very much mm -hmm. for coming out. It's wonderful seeing you today. And for those of you out there that would like more information about the Libertarian Party, you can join us online at www.lp.org. You can call 1-800-ELECT-US and we'll send you out a free packet of information. So thanks again and thanks for watching and we'll see you next time on The Libertarian Alternative.
Thank you.